This is Because I Said So, Parenting Advice, with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved, from American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Roseman. The show is called Because I Said So four words associated with a traditional and a biblically based approach to the raising of children, which is why I use that as the title of the show, because this show does, in fact, reflect a traditional and biblically based approach to the raising of children. I am a heretic outlier psychologist. If you want to find out more about me and my parenting and family ministry, You can go to my website at johnrosemond.com. So as many of you, uh, or as those of you who listen to the show on a regular basis know, I rather relish the fact that I am the thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America. My goal is to hold them accountable for the untruths that they are dispensing from behind the cover of their impressive capital letters after their names and their impressive titles. And mind you, I am licensed by the North Carolina Psychology Board to practice psychology. So I'm an insider to the mental health professions, and I absolutely know what I'm talking about when I talk about the many untruths that uh, they dispense. So coming back or circling back around to the issue of parenting, as we call it in America today, many of you in this audience will know because you were there and you were old enough to at least in retrospect understand what was going on or what happened, uh, as the case may be, um, you know that America radically altered the way we raise children in this country in the late 1960s and early 1970s at the behest of mental health professionals who claimed without a shred of evidence to this effect, they snatched the claim out of thin air, they cut it out of whole cloth, they manufactured it, they invented it, that uh, traditional biblically-based parenting was psychologically harmful to children. And that in order to protect the mental health of future generations, we had to radically alter how we raise children. We had to alter the understandings that formed the foundation of the child-rearing methodology that had prevailed in this country and, in fact, in Western civilization since the founding of this country and since the founding of Western civilization, which goes back to... Okay, this is biblical, you could call it trivia, but it's not really trivia. Who founded Western civilization? Ding, 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 ding. Right or wrong, Abraham and Sarah. And and this is interesting, folks, that there is no evidence whatsoever because child rearing in Western civilization was based on biblical principle, God's word. There is no evidence whatsoever that over several thousands of years since Abraham and Sarah, that the understandings that formed the foundation of the raising of children in Western civilization, which came out of the Middle East, changed at all. And mind you, times were changing. And then along in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and I was there, I was in graduate school, I was in college in the late 60s, 1965 to 69, and then I was in graduate school until 1972, and I was there when all of this was happening. Mind you, I didn't understand what was happening. I was caught up in what was happening. It was a very intellectually exciting time because my generation, and especially those of us who were in psychology school at the time, we really did feel that we were changing the world in in, uh, remarkably positive ways and uh, even bringing about a parenting utopia. And, of course, the end result of this has been a complete mess. The mental health of children has been in 
free fall here in America since uh, we began embracing psychological versus biblical principle in the raising of children. Statistically, the mental health of today's children is 10 times worse than the mental health of children who were raised as I was in the 1950s. You know, along these lines, one of my favorite uh, biblical passages, scriptures, is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Uh, and uh, I believe this is the ESV translation. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. And you can, with theological correctness, insert into that sentence, lean not on your own, parentheses, or anyone else's, for that matter, end of parentheses, understandings. Acknowledge him, this is verse 6, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will keep your paths straight. And, you know, our parenting path in America was reasonably straight before we began listening to people like me tell us how to raise kids. Now, who can say this, what I just said, with more validity than a person who is a member of the professions in question, the mental health professions? And the answer is no one, which is why, circling back to something I said earlier in the program, I am, I believe, the, capital T, capital H, capital E, thorn in the side of the mental health professions in America today. I am the thorn in their side. And in fact, that is my intention. The mental health professions have been a wrecking ball in American parenting. The result of their advice has not been parenting and family utopia. It has been parenting and family chaos, anarchy, disorganization, dysfunction, disorder, and tragedy. Just in the last six or seven years, the uh, suicide rate among teenage girls has nearly doubled. The suicide rate among teenage boys has increased by something like one-third, one-half. And relevant to those statistics is the fact that I have yet to meet someone my age. And I went to high school from 1961 to 1965. My high school in the suburbs of Chicago, Proviso West High School, contained at the time 5,000 students. My graduating class in 1965 contained 910 students. I have yet to meet someone my age who remembers a high school classmate committing suicide. Uh, we do not remember girls starving themselves. We do not remember fellow classmates being removed from school because of drug abuse or alcohol abuse issues. We do not remember fellow classmates being removed from school because of what then would have been termed a nervous breakdown. We do not remember high school classmates uh, cutting themselves or doing anything even remotely similar to that. We do not remember high school classmates taking drugs for things like depression and anxiety. And teachers who taught in the 1950s and early 1960s, without exception, report that uh, things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder were not issues in their classrooms. And by the way, the uh, elementary and high school classrooms of the 1950s and early 60s were, by today's standards, criminally overcrowded. And yet we outperformed today's kids at every single grade level. And by the way, we were burdened, if that is the word, with mothers who, for the most part, would not help us with our homework. So I ask, why are we listening to these people? Why, when it comes to the raising of children, are we listening to Dr. So-and-so? And, and so now the question can be asked, and it's a very valid question. Well, John, you are one of the people in question. Why should we listen to you? Well, because the people in question are dispensing new ideas. 
they are dispensing postmodern ideas concerning children and child rearing, whereas I am dispensing old ideas. I call myself the great parenting plagiarist because, in fact, I've never had an original idea concerning the raising of children. I believe that I have been given a gift of being able to articulate in a compelling way, hopefully compelling way, and I am told uh, by many people that it is a, in fact, compelling manner, the principles that undergirded traditional biblically-based child-rearing, which basically expired in this country in the late 60s and early 1970s, when we began listening once again to people like me tell us how to raise kids. Now, now, really, folks, you, you got to, I mean, to, to sort of wrap this up, you need to ponder the significance of this irony. Ever since American parenting, parents began listening to mental health professionals tell them how to raise children, the mental health of America's children has been in free fall. The mental health of American children is today a complete and utter disaster. Uh, do these people change their tune? No, they don't change their tune at all. They keep recommending the same stuff. They keep saying the same stuff. It doesn't change. It's like they're not paying attention. It's like they can't put two and two together. The first two is their advice. The second two is the mental, the deteriorating mental health of the American child over the last 50 years. They can't put it together and see that, hey, this deterioration is predominantly, primarily their fault. I'll be back in a minute right after this break. Stay with us, please. So welcome back to the show. Uh, I've been talking about the uh, disaster that uh, what I call postmodern psychological parenting has been to the American child, the American parent, the American family, the American marriage, the American school, community, and culture. It's been a disaster. And by the way, this just occurred to me. Before I go any further, somebody recently asked me through an email, John, why do you continue to talk about this issue? Why do you continue over and over again in nearly every program to talk about the disaster that has ensued from American parents listening to mental health professionals tell them how to raise kids? And my answer to the individual was, well, if you asked Rush Limbaugh, why he, over and over and over again, talks about the disaster of liberalism to American society, American culture, he would tell you the same thing. This is the most important issue in American parenting, and uh, that's what I say. Rush Limbaugh would say, this is the most important issue in American culture. Now, he and I are both, we, the only thing we would disagree on is, what is the most important issue in American culture? I believe the most important issue in American culture has to do with this disaster that has ensued in American parenting as a result of listening to mental health professionals. And I say that, and I wonder if he listened to this, if he would agree or not. I say that because I believe that the strength of a culture in this case, America, depends primarily, predominantly upon the strength, the viability, the correctness, if you will, of its parenting practices. We were a strong union prior to the American parent beginning to listen to mental health professionals tell us how to raise children 
and our unity in this country has been deteriorating ever since. The strength of parenting has been deteriorating. The strength, the mental health of the American child has been deteriorating. And the strength of the unity that is required in order to be a viable, strong culture has been deteriorating. And I believe that all of those factors basically stem back to the fact that we are no longer raising children in a correct fashion in this country. And of course, you know, there are people out there who are raising their children properly. I I mean, I know some, but uh, I will also tell you that they are few and far between. And I will also tell you that they are regarded as somewhat weird by their peers. Because when you raise children properly in America today, you stick out like a sore thumb. So anyway, a, a fellow recently asked if I think any of the parenting advice that's come out of the psychology and related mental health professions has been worthwhile. Has any of the advice been worthwhile? And he had just heard me speak somewhere in America on the many problems I believe are traceable to what I call postmodern psychological parenting. It's postmodern because it's relativistic, do your own thing. It's psychological because it's based on bogus psychological theory. And the term parenting implies that it's a technology, which it is not. Anyway, that's my term, postmodern psychological parenting for the current child-rearing paradigm that American parents began embracing at the behest of mental health professionals in the late 1960s. So my answer to the question, has any of the parenting advice that's come out of psychology and related mental health professions been worthwhile, was no. When one's first premises are wrong, then almost everything the person in question contends is going to be wrong. If the person in question throws enough darts with a, bi- with a blindfold on, however, he is likely to hit the dartboard on occasion, but being correct about something will be an accident. So, as I've already said, postmodern psychological parenting is founded on psychological theory, more specifically three schools of psychological thought, humanism, behaviorism, and Freudianism, all three of which consist of unverified or disproven ideas. Humanism proposes, for example, that high self-esteem is a desirable personal attribute, an idea that has been conclusively disproven. It has been discovered, in fact, that people with high opinions of themselves, high self-esteem, lack what is called emotional resilience. Think millennials on college campuses after the 2016 presidential election having to go to safe spaces because they were so upset and cuddle teddy bears and puppies. So again, people with high opinions of themselves lack emotional resilience. They tend to underperform relative to their ability level because high self-esteem is essentially an entitlement mentality. People with high self-esteem believe anything they do is worthy of merit because that's what they've been told. You know, if they scribble on a piece of paper and bring it to the teacher, their parents, uh, they are told this is great. It's uh, it's uh, brilliant. And as a consequence of that, when you believe that anything you do is worthy of merit, you are likely to underperform rather than do your best. And that is what the research currently shows concerning people with high self-esteem. And by the way, people with high self-esteem, for similar reasons, are pro- in other words, because it's an entitlement mentality, are prone to abusive and other antisocial behaviors when things don't go their way. Because people with high self-esteem believe what they want, they deserve to have, and they believe because they deserve what they want, that the ends justify the means. So going to behavioral psychology, which is the current paradigm that is used in the discipline of children in this country, Uh, No one has ever proven that behavior modification works reliably on human beings. 
Behavior modification is a Darwinian proposition. The proposition in question is, listen carefully. This is Charles Darwin talking through B.F. Skinner, the father of behavioral psychology. The same principles that govern the behavior of an amoeba, planaria, rat, and dog also govern the behavior of human beings. That is clearly Darwinian. Darwin's theory is bogus. Behavior modification is bogus. It does work on dogs and rats. It does not work on human beings. Why? Because of something called free will, choice. And the fact that behavior modification does not work on human beings goes a long way toward ex towards explaining why post-1960s discipline based on a behavior modification paradigm based on the idea that you discipline a child simply by manipulating consequences, has become so difficult and often seems so ineffective. And then you go to Freudian theory, and nothing Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, ever proposed has been verified. He was a self-deluded fraud. Freud was a fraud. The begging question then becomes, why are his theories still taught in graduate-level psychology programs? Well, these theories are taught in graduate school psychology programs, even though they've never been proven or in some cases have been disproven, uh, because if they admitted that these theories are bogus, they would end up with nothing to teach psychology students. Once again, I call myself quite often the great parenting plagiarist because I don't dispense new ideas. New child-rearing ideas have proven themselves to be a disaster. Child mental health has fallen off a cliff since the 1960s. Raising children has become the number one source of stress in the life of the average American mother. And behavior problems in American schools have gone through the roof. The further problem, as I see it, is that America's parents and educators continue to turn to mental health professionals for solutions to these very problems. Excuse me? These people's new ideas created these problems. When a child's grandparents were the go-to experts, when parents experienced a parenting bump in the road, things held together reasonably well. And the grandparents in question, by the way, might not have had more than a high school education. For all of the above reasons, I advocate for the old way of doing things, the notion that an old way is better than a new way is anathema to some people. But the people I know who are raising their kids the old way, meaning they have no personal electronic devices, computers in their rooms, video games, these are children who have daily routines of chores. Their parents put more of an emphasis on character development than achievement. These people are having great success. These parents aren't stressed out. Their kids are polite, responsible, and hardworking, and no one is seeing a therapist or taking psychiatric drugs. I mean, folks... That is my consistent observation of people who raise their children the old way. They are doing well. Their children are doing well. Their families are doing well. No one is seeing a therapist. No one is taking a bogus psychiatric drug. But perhaps the best thing about the old way is it makes sense. The old ideas don't strain the brain. It is probably, in fact, a general rule that the more difficult something is to understand, the less valid it is. In closing, my fellow Christian brothers and sisters, consider that psychology is the most atheistic profession in America. Thanks for joining the show. I broadcast every Saturday afternoon on American Family Radio, 6 o'clock, Eastern, 5 o'clock Central, and so on and so forth. Once again, thanks for joining us. God bless you. God bless your families. Hope you can join us again next week. Same time, same station. Bye-bye.
This is Because I Said So, parenting advice with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved. From American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Folks, welcome to the show and glad you could join us. Uh, I'm John Roseman, your host. The show is called Because I Said So. It's called Because I Said So because we are here on the show. We are the last remaining hope. <laughs> How's that for self drama? The last remaining hope. For the preservation of traditional, biblically-based parenting in America. And those four words, because I said so, are intimately associated with a traditional and even biblically-based point of view concerning the rearing of children. Yes, biblically-based, because I said so. Paul, in his letters twice, I believe, says, children, obey your parents in all things. He does not say, obey your parents because they give you a good reason. Obey your parents because they explain themselves adequately. Obey your parents because they offer you a reward. Obey your parents because they threaten you with a horrendous punishment. He simply says, obey your parents. Why should you obey your parents? Because they say so. That's it. Therefore, those four words are reflective of a biblical understanding of how to raise kids. And uh, so the show is called Because I Said So, because we're all about what is now in America called parenting. I don't like the word, but I use it because if I start using words I like, like rearing children, child raising, I run the risk of just kind of beginning to stumble verbally. So parenting, it's a very quick word to uh, to use and to say. So uh, received an email. And by the way, if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, a topic that you'd like for me to speak on during the show, then please send me an email at radio at rosemond, R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D dot com. And I did receive such an email just the other day from a presumably young mother. Uh, It is obvious that anyway, she is young to being a parent. And she writes, I have taught my four-year-old son that he is the boss. I have given him too many choices and too many explanations. I've allowed him to manipulate me, disobey me, and disrespect me. Ever since I began devouring your radio show and newspaper columns, however, my eyes have been opened. Wonderful. What a blessing you've given me today. Thank you so much. It's been a few weeks since I started putting your old school principles into practice, and I've made some progress, but I'm still getting into lots of power struggles with my son. After four years of not being the boss, how do I now turn this ship around? I'm finding that he won't obey unless I threaten him with something like a spanking. How do I get him to obey simply because I'm the authority? Now, that is an excellent question. And the answer is this, that you turn this ship around by doing exactly what you have been doing with some modifications that I will explain momentarily. The good news is that you realize that you've set some very undesirable precedents. And for most parents, that in and of itself is the biggest hurdle hurdle of all. The second biggest hurdle is understanding the proper consequences, and this blows people's minds, are not the key to the proper exercise of parent authority. The idea that parent authority is conveyed vis-a-vis proper consequences properly delivered is a post-1960s understanding that derives from behavioral psychology, which is yet another bogus 
psychological set of theories, or more accurately stated, a bogus psychological theory system. By the way, slight detour, but relevant to the discussion, B.F. Skinner, the father of behavioral psychology, never proved what he set out to prove. And what he set out to prove was a Darwinian proposition. Listen to it very carefully. He set out to prove, B.F. Skinner, that the same principles that govern the behavior of an amoeba, planarium, rat, dog, pigeon, also govern the behavior of human beings. That is Charles Darwin speaking through the centuries, using B.F. Skinner as his contemporary mouthpiece. And no psychologist has ever proven that behavior modification works reliably on human beings. Behavior modification works reliably on dogs. You reward a dog for doing something, he keeps on doing it. You punish a dog properly for doing something, he stops doing it. But such is not the case with human beings. And if you are a parent or have ever been a parent, you know this, you just refuse to accept the evidence. There are times when you have rewarded your child for not misbehaving, and he immediately starts misbehaving after he's been rewarded. And there are times when you've punished your child for misbehaving, and it seems as if the punishment caused his behavior to worsen. Why is this the case? Because sinful human beings by nature, are rebellious. Dogs are not by nature rebellious. Rats are not by nature rebellious. Rebellion is uh, unique to human nature. And human beings, therefore, will are likely to rebel, including young children, against any attempt to manipulate their behavior through artificial means, including behavior modification a.k.a. the use of consequences to deliver to discipline a child. Now, hear me clearly. There are times when consequences are appropriate and even necessary. But even when they are appropriate and necessary, parents should not invest themselves in the idea that if they use a proper consequence properly, that it's going to work. Because when you use consequences with human beings, all bets are off. You cannot invest in consequences to solve behavior problems that you are having with a child. In fact, parents who rely on consequences almost always wind up doing what you, the mom who wrote the letter that has prompted this segment of the show, what you are now doing, threatening. Parents who rely on consequences almost always wind up threatening. Authority is a matter of a proper presentation. And to help parents begin walking down this very, for today's parents, unfamiliar road, I've broken it down into six essential elements. It's very simple. Write these down. First of all, do not stoop when talking to a child. Do not, quote, get down to the child's level, end quote. I know they've told you to do that. They being child development specialists, psychologists, blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. They're wrong. Stooping down is a submissive posture that undermines a child's perception of adult authority. Stand upright. Number two. Are you writing this down? You should. When giving instructions or communicating decisions, use the fewest words possible. And in many cases, by the way, the fewest words is simply one. No. If you want toys picked up, say, I want you to pick up these toys. If you want a child to get dressed, say, I want you to get dressed. It's time for you to get dressed. Use the fewest words possible. Number three, preface instructions with authoritative statements such as, I want you to, you need to, it's time for you to, you're going to. I want you to pick up your toys. It's time for you to put on your jacket. You need to sit down to the table. You're going to get in your car seat. 
Number four, do not explain yourself or give reasons for your instructions and decisions. Do not. Let them stand on their own. Almost invariably, explanations lead right into arguments. Number five, when a parent does not give an explanation, the child is prompted by his natural inclination toward rebellion to ask why or why not. Now, don't be fooled. Those are not questions. They are challenges to a parent's authority. They are invitations to do battle, to argue. The proper answer, therefore, to why and why not is because I said so. The title of the show. Contrary to mental health propaganda, there's no evidence that hearing those four words is psychologically harmful. I'm not saying you should scream them or snarl them at a child. Just say them. Child says, why? Just say, well, because I said so. Those four words are, after all, nothing more than an affirmation of the legitimacy of your authority. And lastly, number six, walk away. Say what you have to say. Give the instruction. Because I said so, turn around, walk away. Do not stick around issuing threats Do not stick around giving the child someone to rebel against. Just walk away. Folks, we're coming up on the first break in the show. The only break in the show, actually. The second break in the show is the end of the show. So I hope you stick around through the break and join me for the second half when I'm going to talk a little bit more about psychology. I'm going to read an email I received from a Christian psychologist after last week's show. Back in a moment. Welcome back to the show. Glad you're joining us. Glad glad you could stay with us if that's the case. And if this is the first time that you've tuned into the show, I'm John Roseman, the host. The show is called Because I Said So. It's all about what is today called parenting. And I am carried every Saturday afternoon exclusively on American family radio stations across the country at 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Central Last week, uh, I spent the entire show critiquing psychology. Some would say lambasting. As most of you know in my listening audience, I am a psychologist, duly licensed by the North Carolina Psychology Board. The North Carolina Psychology Board regrets the day they ever gave me a license. They have tried to take it away at least three times. They have tried unsuccessfully. I have had to spend a good amount of money on attorneys to inform my psychology board that I enjoy free speech rights, that just because I say in public what they don't like or what they don't agree with does not mean that I should be prevented or punished from saying it or punished for saying it. And, uh, Uh, believe it or not, this has happened three times now with my own licensing board and the Kentucky psychology licensing board in the year 2013 had the gall, the unmitigated gall, as my mother would have said, to try and force me to remove my syndicated newspaper column from the five Kentucky newspapers that it runs in, including Lexington, Kentucky, because they claimed that by publishing my newspaper column in Kentucky, I was practicing psychology in the Commonwealth of Kentucky without a license issued by them. And they wrote me a letter through the office of the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Kentucky who said I had 30 days to stop publishing said column and said papers or face, get this, imprisonment. That is how threatening I am to the psychology community in America. And if you think that the fact that I draw such fire 
from people in my ostensible profession bothers me? No, it does not. It gives me, in fact, great satisfaction to know that I am succeeding in my one-man war against what I believe is a toxic philosophy, a toxic ideology. I said last week that Paul was being, however unwittingly, prophetic concerning psychology when in his letter, the letter that we identify as Colossians, um, oh gosh, excuse me, folks, do you know what? I left my cell phone on. I'm going to have to turn the cell phone completely off. Isn't that embarrassing? No, it's not really. Okay, it's now off, and uh, I will continue. Okay, so my cell phone is now off. You know, I've got this checklist of things that I do, uh, or I'm supposed to do, before uh, recording a show, including turning off my air conditioning unit uh, the, so that you know, people don't hear this blowing sound in the background, and um, shutting off my cell phone, shutting off the volume on my computer, which is my recording device, and today, unfortunately, I walked in and I thought, well, I can remember what's on that checklist. And I did everything but turn off my cell phone. So my apologies for that. Anyway, I believe that in his letter to the Christian community at Colossae, which we call Colossians, in uh, chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and I believe 10, when Paul warns us against deceptive philosophies that are based on man's own thinking and not on Christ, that he was prophetically speaking about psychology. So anyway, in last week's show, I, some might even say, ranted against uh, psychology because I, and if it, if it sounded like a rant, uh, that's okay, I will admit to it. Because I am very passionate in my belief, uh, my, my belief based on the fact that I am a psychologist and I am a evangelical Christian, a believer in, a follower of Christ Jesus, who believes that Scripture is sufficient in all respects and possesses a biblical worldview, I am very passionate about the fact that I believe that psychology is of Satan. Now, that is a very, you know, almost inflammatory thing to say These in these emotionally sensitive days. It's the kind of thing that even evangelical Christians might wince at. Ooh, psychology is of Satan. Yeah, my esteemed pastor... Dr. Scott Gleason of Tabernacle Baptist, that would be Southern Baptist Church in New Bern, North Carolina, recently did a sermon in which he said that anything we do, any belief we hold, is either consistent with a biblical worldview or not, and if it is not, then it is of Satan. That there is no middle ground, there, is no, there are no shadings of gray between right and wrong, between truth and lies, between God and Satan. And since psychology is not the truth, and it can't be the truth because its theory systems stand in 180 degree opposition to a biblical worldview, there is no overlap between a psychological worldview or belief system and a biblical worldview, then psychology must be lies, must be false, must be, therefore, of Satan. So, in so many words, I said all of that and elaborated on it in last week's show and invited psychologists and Christian psychologists, people who call themselves Christian psychologists, and I said last week, and I will repeat, there ain't no such thing. People who call themselves Christian psychologists are kidding themselves because these are antagonistic worldviews, a Christian worldview and a psychological view worldview, they can't be blended, they can't be reconciled, they cannot be adapted to one another in any way, shape, or form. 
So I invited people who occupy the uh, positions in the profession of psychology to write. And one person wrote, and I'm not going to read their email because it's very, very long. But basically what they said was that I had insulted them and that I had disparaged the four years that they had spent in psychology graduate school and that I had totally dissed their entire life. And, and notice now that uh, they did not mount a logical, rational opposition to anything that I said. They simply became emotional and uh, I hurt their feelings is basically what they said. And they said that they had spent four years, this person, not they, this person said that she had spent four years in graduate school at a Christian university. And here's part of the problem, folks. Christian universities are teaching secular psychology as if it was fact. And they are not telling their graduate students this stuff is inconsistent with a biblical worldview. It's all lies, but you need to know it because you need to know the enemy very, very clearly. And you need to know the tools and the weapons that he is using in contemporary culture. They're not telling their graduate students this. They're teaching secular psychology, which is the most atheistic profession in the world, as if it was the truth. And so anyway, this person said that I had, uh, they had spent all these years learning very valuable stuff and that as a consequence, they were able to help people. Well, let, let me just, and I hope you're in the audience. Let me just explain to you that I used to believe the same thing. And I came to the realization after accepting Christ into my life in the year 2000, that no, I had not learned valuable stuff. I had learned lies. And no, I wasn't helping people. I was simply engaging in spinning wheels in their lives. And I was kidding myself that the people that I was seeing and counseling were being helped by this. And when they didn't show up for appointments and didn't return phone calls after I'd seen them once or twice or three times, I just thought, well, they weren't ready for change in their lives. No, it was because I wasn't being helpful. And after accepting Christ into my life and after looking into and beginning to study and beginning to practice from a, a biblical perspective, beginning to practice biblical counseling instead of secular psychology, I began seeing amazing results in, in, in people and uh, specifically in parents. And this is what I do today. I go around the country and I speak in churches and Christian schools primarily and I tell every audience, and some people I'm aware are more receptive than, than others, that the church should not let psychology get even a foot in the door. And I'm including Christian psychology because, as I said last week, people who call themselves Christian psychologists are psychologists who are marketing themselves to a Christian audience. That's all they are. They are no different than a secular atheist psychology in terms of their worldview and their potential to do harm. And folks, keep in mind, I've been there and I've done that and I fully admit it and I have repented for the harm that I caused in my career when I was in that stage of my career during which I believed in psychology as a saving force in American culture. Well, again, the most uh, rapid 30 minutes in my life have uh, come almost to an end. Glad you could join us, folks, again every Saturday afternoon exclusively on American Family Radio. And uh, God bless all of you and God bless your families. 